women's rights are violated and they're defended in the name of culture. The killing of women for exercising autonomy is also not just found only in Muslim context. Three women a day are murdered by their significant partners in the United States. On 26 November 2007, women's rights advocates from all over the world <laughs> gathered to mark the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. On that day, we launched the global campaign to stop stoning and killing women, and we had a conference on culture women violence, rejecting cultural justifications for violence against women. I'm Vivian Wee director of the consortium Women's Empowerment in Muslim Context. The slogan we had was, no excuses for violence against women. This issue of how culture is misused to legitimize violence and making it a non-problem has been highlighted by Yakin Ertog, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women. For this reason, we invited her to be our keynote speaker on that day. In the past 15 years, much progress has been achieved in making violence against women visible, in setting standards for its eradication and in guiding policy and legal reform in all countries. Violence against women is no longer a fate for the world's women. However, in all parts of the world, women continue to face violence due to the patriarchal legacy, which is sustained in different forms and degrees in asserting control over women's lives, especially their sexuality. The gravest form of violence, no doubt, is the killing of women. Femicide manifests in a number of forms, including murder in the context of intimate partner violence, sexually motivated murder, killings of prostitutes, killing in the name of honor, female infanticide, dowry deaths, etc. While murder in itself is brutal, stoning to death is the cruelest form. To stop violence against women requires concerted global effort. So at our international gathering, women activists from organizations and networks in different countries came together to share experiences of how violence against women is being perpetuated through cultural legitimation. When we talk about religious fundamentalisms, is the use of religion by certain political and religious leaders, institutions and parties to legitimise as divine and thereby render unchallengeable authoritarian political power and as such to essentialise social control. And of course, this has particularly negative consequences for women's human rights. These days, when you talk about women's rights in particular, but rights in general, they suddenly everyone talks about culture. Uh, this is not permissible. I ask for my rights, but this is not in our culture. This is not in our religion. You can't have this, you can't have that. So the question really is, why? I think there's a growing use of culture, religion, uh, to take away women's rights, but also to make them immobile, to silence them, to make them not speak up for their rights. And I think that is something which we found with the international uh, events post-September 11th, the bombing of Afghanistan, the political religious parties who used religion to further their political aims. And to me this is simply because we live in a patriarchal world and this is the culture, fundamentally dominant culture of any society, is patriarchal, and it is patriarchy that we have to challenge and to work against. We can't get diverted into thinking these are little cultural events that are happening somewhere. This is across the world, and we need to have a global response to it.
I think there is a belief sometimes that uh, violence, at least those of us in the United States think that violence against women doesn't exist in our own country. In fact, three women a day are murdered by their husbands or significant partners in the United States. 31% of American women will be violated physically, will be physically abused during their lifetime. Women have been seen as the source of temptation particularly Christian fundamentalists and evangelicals, still hold this theory of the man as the head of the household and in charge and dominating both wife and children um, in, in a very serious and literal way. And we find in those situations that women are much more trapped First of all, the possibility of violence is greater because the man believes it is his job. He is divinely ordained by God to discipline and control women. I would request a minute of silence to honor those women, young and old, Muslim and not, from wherever they were, who dared to be different and who dared to pursue their dreams. At our international conference, Women activists shared various strategies used in stopping violence against women in their countries, particularly strategies that reject cultural justifications for such violence. We do mapping and monitoring. We also challenge the legal system. Because of the, uh, the local policy have influenced the women, they have some victims. Actually, the women's organizations have, you know, like uh, applied to the Supreme Court do the judicial review for the local governments. So we also have a dialogue with national governments, and then we have to engage with the religious leader in community before we avoid them. But now it's important to, to, to have communication, to dialogue with them, because they are uh, in the community. They could, uh, you could help us to face the situation. Shadi Sadr, a human rights lawyer from Iran, who is one of the leaders of the Stop Stoning Forever campaign, presented strategies used in this campaign to stop the killing of women by stoning. One year after the appointment of a fundamental government in Iran in spring of 2006, rumors spread that two people, a man and a woman, were stoned in Mashhad. First, we began to research to find how many women were sentenced to stoning. This was done with the help of a network of lawyers throughout Iran. We found that in the prisons, 12 women and two men were sentenced and waiting to be stoned to death. Then we began our work on two levels. One was within Iran, where we tried to break the taboo by speaking publicly about stoning and by informing the people that such a punishment is indeed taking place now. On the other hand, on the international level, we mobilized the international community to put pressure on Iran to stop stoning as a punishment and to change the law. Our hope is to eliminate stoning from the laws of Iran. And through working on this Stop Stoning campaign, we want to demonstrate that the Iranian legal system discriminates women. What we learned from working on those cases was the importance of using a multiple-pronged approach and drawing on all the possible resources that you have. So it was the importance of um, being able to build boundaries across different religious or ethnic, in the case of Nigeria communities, to come to an understanding of, in this case, women's oppression and the specificity of discrimination against women in different places, so that solidarity could be built on the basis of empathy and moving forward, as opposed to on the basis of, oh, you poor things, but we're okay. And that's how we developed what we called the bridge building workshops, where 
people of different communities, first of all, meant separately to analyse um, gender discrimination and oppression against women in their own communities, and then to look at other. So the Muslims looked at Muslim laws and Muslim practices, and the Christians looked at Christian laws and, and Christian social practices and understandings, and then each of the groups would look at the other, and then they would come together on the basis of that having applied the same frameworks of analysis uh, to, to, to work on how can we support each other in ways that set, strengthen each of our struggles because it's a struggle of all of us. And, and that helped also in um, not creating backlashes in the particular communities where cases were being carried on. Have you ever heard about a people trying to, to, pursue, to pursue those killers, those those people who committed honor killing. Maybe it's also one of the strategies tried to bring them to court so that the other will be afraid and stop uh, doing it, even if it's uh, for, for honor, for the honor of the family. My suggestion, and it's high time for international solidarity, and particularly the, the, the networks of women living under Muslim law, it's a high time to work on the legislation reform. We have been talking a lot about this. Legislation reform is very important. Legislation reform is very important. And I think this might be our strategy for the coming decades or worse. As a result of our discussions in Istanbul, we came to an agreement that under no circumstances should we accept culture being used to legitimize violence. So we affirmed our slogan, no excuses for violence against women. What we agreed upon through our discussions was that the cultural legitimation of violence against women is a human rights issue. Therefore, it is a problem of the whole of human society. It is not just a problem of only the victims or only women. So why is this a human rights issue? Because by legitimating violence against women as a cultural norm, it is implying that some people in society have fewer rights than others, that they have to suffer violence as a social norm. So at the end of the day, everyone in society needs to ask what kind of society we want. Do we want a society where everyone has the equal right to live lives free of violence? Or do we want a society where some people are seen as having the right and power to inflict violence on others who are powerless to do anything about it? And that's a question that everyone has to answer, not just victims, not just women.